The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Everybody has a part to play in the recovery of the monarch. Oh, look, a monarch right here. Planting flowers in a garden is a great start. In my personal life, I love to get out and recreate on, on rivers and streams. And so I don't really feel like my job is, is work. My favorite story was the one about Geraldine Watson. I never planned to be a botanist. Just because she's the only person I've ever known that really reminded me of Yoda. outside for 30 years. Can y'all see it? The branch yeah, kind of yeah. comes over. Up. Oh, right there, there he's just moving, oh, yeah. It. It's October in the Rio Grande Valley. Just check this one. These folks have come from near and far to the Edinburgh Wetlands World Birding Center. Let's go. To appreciate a wealth of flying colors. Right there is Teensy. They just spotted a second U.S. record. But these nature tourists aren't here for the birds. Never seen it in the U.S. The flying things they're after are butterflies. And this is just one stop on the annual Texas Butterfly Festival. Okay. Good. South Texas is like heaven to birders. Uh, it's also pretty spectacular for butterflies. Here we have a skipper. You can see more species of butterflies White peacock. than anywhere else in the United States. Oh, yeah. It's just another aspect of the, the wildlife watching that's so fantastic here in the valley. This is the malachite that we saw earlier. It uh, brings attention to uh, nature uh, and is also a great economic support for our community. The popularity of chasing butterflies is a fairly new phenomenon. Another one. Butterfly field guides didn't really start coming out until the mid-90s, I guess. And like birding, you eventually start checking them off a list and that sort of thing. These tropical ones have been seen at the park. Butterflies are really birders that have gone over to the dark side. It's, it's just a progression. Right here. Today I found four or five lifers, butterflies I've never seen before, and it's a great, great thrill. Butterfly watching also draws those who just want to relax and enjoy some of nature's small wonders. You just can't help but be interested in it. I think they're beautiful. I just like the colors. They're so pretty and they're so fragile and short-lived. Though fragile indeed, one particular butterfly is known for its epic annual migration. Right up on top. The monarch. The monarch. Each fall, millions of monarchs funnel through Texas from as far north as Canada and route to their wintering sites in central Mexico. Along this central flyway, monarchs can be seen in flight or taking rest stops along the way. That was a bunch of them. Catching sight of a monarch roost is something that landowners like Dobb and Kay Cunningham look forward to. It's always a big thrill when they start coming in. This part of Texas is kind of plain. But there is a beauty in this country that you have to be patient and wait for, and the monarchs are one of those. I didn't know they were so unique and complicated, and it is quite a phenomenon. That these delicate insects can fly up to 3,000 miles and somehow converge on the same patch of mountains in Mexico is one of the miracles of nature. One of the most unique migrations that I've ever heard of. 
But the miraculous monarch migration is in trouble. We still have masses of them. They're still coming, but not near the numbers. It brings joy to me to, to see them coming and great distress when I think the numbers have fallen. What Texas ranchers have noticed has been confirmed by surveys. The numbers that are returning back to Mexico have declined considerably. Monarch numbers have dropped to a fraction of those recorded when monitoring began in the early 1990s. While there are concerns about illegal logging and cold snaps impacting wintering monarchs, their biggest challenges may be those they face on their return in the spring and their dependence on a single plant for reproduction. During the spring migration, we're not too aware of it. We're, we don't see them in masses the way we see them in the fall. But that's when it's critical because they're returning from Mexico, they're trying to lay eggs, and the only host plant is uh, milkweed or Asclepias. Because it's an international animal, you know, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, there are so many variables. We can help Texas lead the efforts in the recovery of the monarch butterfly. As part of a tri-national restoration effort, Texas Parks and Wildlife has launched a native pollinator conservation plan. Everybody has a part to play in the recovery of the monarch, and that's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter whether you live in the city, in the country. Uh, you can help restore habitat. It's decisions we make. Planting flowers in a garden is a great start. The best we can do is to be thoughtful about how we manage land and, you know, do we need to mow all the milkweed? Do we, you know, do we cut down all the flowers in the fall in the roadside ditches or do we, you know, leave some things for those butterflies that are coming back through? And I think the more we understand that, the more we'll, we'll be able to do our part. Look, there's a couple of milkweed bugs on the backside of this. Park interpreter Craig Hensley is certainly doing his part. Craig oversees volunteers who monitor milkweed, monarchs, and other butterflies each spring at Guadalupe River State Park. Isn't that a gorgeous butterfly? Oh, look, a monarch right here, right there. Today is one of our butterfly surveys. Have you seen any eggs or larvae? No. We also monitor a patch of milkweed in the park uh, for the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project. Don't you get that one, I'll, I'll get, get this, this one. one right. We count milkweeds, look for monarch eggs. We're just coming out of a drought and our milkweed has been low, so we're really excited because we're seeing more and more stopping here and they are laying eggs. Here it is, right here. Oh, cool. A lot of people feel if they follow the monarch that they get a, an idea about the health of the whole ecosystem. These are arrivals from Mexico. They're kind of beat up. Yeah. You know, you start looking at the natural world and you see declines in bumblebee populations and, and other native pollinator populations. You see what's happening with the honeybee. And All right, let's go out to the patch. You realize that, you know, there's a delicate balance of the natural world. And so that's the monarch egg. It's amazing how much of that balance focuses on very, very tiny little insects that, that we are uh, highly dependent upon. Without them, we have potentially a lot less food in our grocery stores and it probably costs a lot more. So the picture of the monarch is a bigger picture of pollinators in general. A lot to learn about monarchs in Texas um, as they pass through north and south. Let's keep going. Though focused on the big picture, for Craig, hey, this is also personal. Did you get the two monarch adults? I have two grandchildren, and um, I don't want them to grow up without the chance to see a monarch butterfly. And my fear is that that possibility exists. I think the world becomes a lesser place if we watch things like the monarch disappear or become rare. Golly, look at that, right there. Oh. They're gorgeous little animals. and now if we could just see another hundred of them. And a great gateway animal, for, for, especially for kids getting into nature. How many? A lot. A lot. Next spring when she gets Back right on the border, Texas, Carol Culler also uses right monarchs there. to introduce kids to nature. So if you'll put your finger up in the air, you don't want to? At first, they're a little afraid of having it touch their finger. And by the end of the presentation, they all want you to put the butterfly on their finger. You ready? OK, and there they you all want to say bye to Monarch and let Ooh, it go. Wow. Carol participates in a citizen science project tagging monarchs during fall migration. This little tag then traces 
where that butterfly came from, One, eight, seven. what day it was tagged, how many miles that it's flown down to Mexico. There he goes, happy trails. We yeah. don't have all the answers. We don't know every detail of this process. We do get a lot of data just from that one tag. There's a soldier right in front of you there. So amazing. Meanwhile, just downriver, Terrific. the Texas Butterfly Festival wraps up with a splash of color at Falcon State Park. <laughs> oh, awesome. I've never seen anything like this. We've seen well over 100 species here in this garden over a three-day period. I've seen more butterflies in one day than I've seen in my whole life put together. A lot of butterflies. Among the bounty of butterflies Thanks, Ma. and one fancy moth it's a beautiful one. are also many monarchs gassing up at the butterfly garden before heading to Mexico. When he opens out, it looks like a little jet plane. Our manager wanted to do some landscaping in the park. I said, well, why not? Let's make a butterfly garden. And it grew and grew and grew. Till now we have about an acre of plants, all native right here to this area. It's been successful beyond our wildest imaginations. Whether by planting milkweed or other native flowering plants. See the white bar on the wing? Whether by studying butterflies or just appreciating them. Better angle from over here. Watching out for these colorful insects is something anyone can do. There she goes. Building that awareness Bye. will hopefully make a difference. In return, butterflies just might remind us life is fragile and amazing with much to admire in the smallest details. They're really awesome animals. Conservation to me is this very optimistic, affirmative, forward-looking concept. And as a conservation professional, I'm filled with this hope and this desire to make a difference, a lasting impact on the health of natural resources. And I want my seven and nine-year-old sons to be able to enjoy that when they're adults and pass that same appreciation for natural resources on to their children. Yeah, I'm gonna put him back in here. Any more in there, Mike? A big focus of what I do is work to protect and restore wild and native fish and the rivers and streams that they depend on. I just want to get everybody together because we're trying to distribute the workload here and they want to stage river cleanups as well. Tim is the chief of our habitat and conservation branch. He leads a diverse group of individuals that focus on protecting and enhancing of our aquatic resources in Texas. So we have a blanket agreement and we have a list of activities. Since 2010, we've entered into agreements with over 100 landowners to do um, stream corridor conservation projects to conserve these lands along these flowing waters like, like you see here. In my personal life, I love to get out and recreate on, on rivers and streams. And so I don't really feel like my job is, is work. So conserving those natural resources is about conserving that relationship that I want to pass down to my own children. We have a lot of them. I better pick them before the birds. Make your way over to the lower falls. I feel like it's my job as a rivers biologist here at Texas Parks and Wildlife to help people understand what would be lost if, if we didn't take care of these resources. The 220 native fishes that are found in these rivers, 30% of those have significant conservation needs and we could easily just let those species slip away and no one might notice. We have these iconic scenic rivers and I think it's up to programs like ours at the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to help people understand what would be lost if we let that happen. I feel like I've made a difference. I feel like the team that I work with has made a difference. I associate my work with not just conserving fish and wildlife, but preserving a way of life. If I can have a role in helping more people get out and experience the outdoors or promote a way of life that's going to lead to a healthier, happier society, then, then I'm all for it.
this great? Yeah, it's beautiful. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Ron Cabley is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. My name is Ron Cabley, and I produced stories for the TV show for 23, 24 years. And my favorite story was the one about Geraldine Watson. And just because she's the only person I've ever known that really reminded me of Yoda. Yoda? Is that it from Star Wars? I never in my life met a person like her. You know, an 80-year-old Yoda in the middle of the forest in East Texas. That was Geraldine. The perfection that's in the balance of nature is empirical evidence of the creative genius of God. He set it up, whether he used the process of evolution or whatever process he used, I don't know and I don't care. But once you get to know the, all the intimate details of all of this, it's incredible. She would never admit it, but Geraldine Watson knows as much about the ecology of the big thicket as anyone. For over half a century, she has fought to preserve the forests, animals, and plants here in the East Texas Piney Woods. I never planned to be a botanist. I never planned to be an ecologist. I never planned to be a park ranger. It, I just seemed, simply seemed to drift into things. <laughs> Today, Geraldine spends most of her time in this 10-acre preserve, caretaker of a tiny remnant of the beautiful virgin forest of her childhood. I stopped, and I walked out on that point, and I said, this is where I'm going to spend my declining years. Don't you think this is a nice spot? All around us are little spots like this. If we just look for them and protect them and, and appreciate them, you know, we'll always have them. Geraldine has lived her entire life within a few miles of the East Texas town of Warren. Warren is mostly a throughway for a region that produces wood and paper products. It's an industry that contributes billions of dollars each year to the local economy. But with that economic impact come consequences. The decline of the big thicket started while Geraldine was still a child. Huge old growth forests were cut to fuel the fires of progress. And that fueled the fire of Geraldine's activism. I was with the Park Service for 15 years as the plant ecologist, and all of that time, I was screaming and yelling and jumping up and down, how are we gonna save the world? if we don't understand it, if we don't understand what makes it what it is.
By the 1960s, 90% of the virgin forests were already gone. That's about the time the Big Thicket Association was formed, and Geraldine was one of the founding members. She could talk to groups, and she was so good at explaining what was unique about the Big Thicket. Geraldine was as comfortable testifying to congressional subcommittees as she was talking to Audubon groups. And her book, Big Thicket Plant Ecology, elevated her to near rock star status within the botany world. Her eight ecosystems that she put together gave everyone a not better understanding of what we were trying to save and why we were trying to save it. I think her contribution was just immeasurable. In the old days, there were very few people like me, and we were called those little old ladies in tennis shoes. But those little old ladies turned out to be a formidable group. It wasn't a smooth path, and there was controversy involved. And so she, she struggled to get this message across, but she was victorious. That victory came with a cost. Geraldine and her family were ostracized by many people in their East Texas community. The 10 years we were trying to get a bill passed, you have no idea what my children went through. But the family stuck together through good times and bad. And one of her children, David, grew up to be as passionate about conservation as Geraldine herself. It was David who helped her manage the preserve, right up until his death in a car wreck in early 2008. Geraldine was devastated. I often uh, think that I am not proud of anything that I have done that uh, as my children have grown up and grown older and my husband is gone, uh, I think of all of the days and the hours I spent uh, out in the woods and the fields with other people when I could have been spending time with them. But here, Geraldine is not alone. She has found peace and purpose at one with her land and her higher power. She gets in the car and says, I'm ready to go. Geraldine is still trying to save the world. Only now, she's limited her efforts to these 10 acres. But what she's done here is remarkable, providing tangible proof that land can be restored and ecosystems can be revived. Geraldine would just call it preserving empirical evidence of the creative genius of God. You know, I would rather somebody knock me on the head and throw me in the river than for me to sit on a sofa watching soap operas and eating <laughs> myself into oblivion. <laughs> Thank you.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.